So, you finally beat the Bone Lab campaign. You fully adopted the grind set mindset, and you didn't sleep until Jimmy said you could. I'm a little tired, a little wired, and I think I deserve a little appreciation. The 25 second long campaign sure took a lot out of you, but you did it. You finally did it. But now you're left with a familiar feeling. The same feeling that washed over your bare, naked bones when you finished Boneworks and Duck Season. The feeling of, eh, what the f just happened, and who do I need to shoe? Look, you're not alone. Stress Level Zero is infamous for adopting the show-don't-tell method of storytelling, which may or may not be code for, eh, just make a tech demo and let our audience come up with the story from a couple of wall and clipboard scribblings. All jokes aside though, the Bone Lab story is a bit confusing if you aren't paying close attention. But thankfully it's at least a bit easier to understand than the plot to its predecessor, Bonework. That's why this video will present the full story of Bone Lab and will also draw important connections between Boneworks and Duck Season, as they're imperative to understanding the Stress Level Zero multiverse. Without further ado, let's get into the Bone Lab story. After inputting your height and t-shirt size, you start the Bone Lab campaign in a mysterious room with the floating dice and a mirror. You roll the dice and discover it lets you change your entire body, which we'll refer to as your avatar. Next thing you know, the game hands you a noose and, uh... Well, you do the rest. Suddenly, the room fades into a medieval village scenery as you stare back at the mob of villagers who look all too eager to make you pay for whatever it is you did. As the villagers remove the metal platforms you're standing on, a mysterious lightning bolt delivers you a blade from the heavens. Using this blade to cut yourself free, you fall like a hundred feet into the catacombs below without so much as a scuffed knee. And it may be at this point where you start to suspect the reality you're in may or may not be real life. As you proceed through the cave system, you uncover several clipboard notes and wall scribblings that are very easy to miss, but pay attention. Most of Bone Lab's direct storyline is revealed through these writings, making it super easy to miss if you're just running through the caves. One of the first important notes you find is from a clipboard just before you break through a boarded up opening. After great deliberation with the Underdwellers, we have decided to seal up these tombs and retract any record of their existence. For too long have we retained this devilish pact allowing these subterranean demons to toy with the souls of our flock. Henceforth, we shall ensure our destitutes are unable to reach these horrible halls at any cost. So, what's this all about? This bit of information, you come to realize that the benevolent villagers you had the privilege of meeting just before you got to these catacombs had an agreement with whomever resides in these cave systems. Essentially, the villagers would send members of their flock underground to be experimented on by these, quote, cave dwellers. But why? What did the villagers get out of the agreement, and what sorts of experiments were being conducted down there? This is cleared up a bit by another clipboard you find soon after the first one. This one appears to be from some sort of cast member. Oh laddie, it seems a Heaven's Leech elder has decided to seal off catacomb access from their town after stumbling down here. Continuously, they have sent free-thinking dissenters down into these tombs, and we have done our best to study and understand how the simulation is learning. The Heaven's Reach Fantasyland simulation is deciding to go purely self-sustaining. They are now viewing cast members in a negative light. Left to their own devices, the AI has become extremely conservative in their ideologies. We will probably need to abandon this research dungeon and seal off the back paths into myth. Okay, so when combined with the first one, this clipboard provides a lot of clarity about your situation and the universe in which your character resides. You are, in fact, not in reality itself, but a simulation called MythOS. In Boneworks, Bone Lab's predecessor, you learn that MythOS is a 3D operating system of sorts made by a company called Monogon Industries. Sort of like Windows or Mac OS, but for 3D virtual spaces. Boneworks took place in an area called MythOS City an entire city structure that runs on the MythOS operating system. Conversely, in Bone Lab, you are in Fantasyland, which can be thought of as a third-party app or a game that also runs on the MythOS 3D operating system. You can think of this as the real-life version of the Boneworks game running on Windows and Steam VR, which can be equated to MythOS in this metaphor. But virtual reality in MythOS doesn't work like it does in our world. As I'm sure you know, in real life, when you put on a VR headset, you are simply staring at screens really close to your eyes, sort of simulating an alternate reality using mere vision and hearing alone. 
However, in the Stress Level Zero universe, Monogon facilitates access to their virtual worlds by using a dangerous material called Void Matter to metaphysically transport your consciousness to that of Myth OS City or Fantasyland. When you put on one of Monogon's headsets, you are actually transported to another version of reality. You use all of your senses as you would in real life, making it perhaps the perfect recipe for a convincing simulation. In Fantasyland, all of those villagers from the beginning are increasingly sentient NPCs or non-playable characters, sort of like the citizens you'll find walking around GTA. And they're becoming wary of the in-character Bone Lab staff for tinkering with the souls of their kin. As you continue through the caves, you fight off several enemies including nobodies, Saber Lake Omni Projectors, and Crablets, eventually reaching some sort of research facility. Nobodies are those humanoid digital entities that are usually orange, but change to different colors like purple, green, and blue the more corrupted slash sentient they become. Nobodies are actually what all Fantasyland villagers originate as before being dressed up and sent up to Heaven's Reach. Other Nobodies have the purpose of building and constructing Myth OS. Crablets are basically those headcrab things from Half-Life, but Instead of being big aliens, they're VR headsets with legs whose purpose is to pounce on the face of their targets in order to immerse them even further within the simulation. And in Boneworks, we see just what happens to those who succumb to the Crablet's intrusive immersion tactics. It's not known exactly what the purpose of these Crablets are or who sent them. Theories range from being another type of corruption containment protocol for Monogon to the use of these Crablets to purposefully immerse their clientele even further into their simulations. Those orange hazmat wearing roly poly oly looking dudes are known as Omni Projectors. Dispatched by Monogon contracted private security company called Saber Lake, these Omni Projectors can be thought of as a personified antivirus, as they're designed to eliminate all corruptions within Myth OS, so you can pay attention to exactly which entities they attack in order to know what is considered a corruption. But why is there so much damn corruption happening in Myth OS and Fantasyland to begin with? Well, to answer that, we'll have to consult Boneworks again. So, the basic plot of Boneworks is that protagonist Arthur Ford, security director for Monogon's Boneworks project, theorizes that if he's able to access Void Matter directly, also known as entering the Void Way, he'd be able to achieve immortality. In order to do that, though, he'll have to basically turn Myth OS City to shit so he can traverse the Boneworks, which is Myth OS's backend that converts Void Matter into safe, usable assets for Myth OS apps like Myth OS City and Fantasyland. The Boneworks is also what facilitates safe travel between the user's mind and consciousness and these virtual 3D worlds. For another real-world comparison, you can think of Boneworks like a game engine like Marrow or Unreal. The Boneworks processes void energy, sort of like computer code, into tangible assets in Myth OS. When real-life Arthur Ford commits to his goal, he begins by inserting a mysterious USB stick into Monogon servers. Well, okay, it's not really that mysterious, since it's plastered with Gammon, Monogon's main competitor. But anyway, this uploads a virus to Myth OS City, which disables its resurrection field, thus allowing Ford to now spawn in the Boneworks, rather than Myth, descending him one level closer to reaching the Voidway. In addition to the destruction of Myth OS caused by Ford, something else is directly contributing to the corruption and sentience of the Null Bodies. This is likely due to a drink the Nulls consume called Melon Belly. Melon Belly is a drink fermented from digital melons developed by a mysterious group called the Lava Gang in an attempt to control these Null Men to work for them instead of Monogon. However, a particular duck season easter egg reveals that there may be more to the story than first meets the eye, but we'll get back to that later since we actually find out who Lava Gang is towards the end of the Bone Lab campaign. Continuing through the opening section of the campaign, also called Descent, you uncover more clues to Monogon's abandonment of their staff and Fantasyland as a whole. You notice depressing wall engravings, wondering where the f everybody went. Also uncover another cast member clipboard. <sighs> Well, I finally accidentally destroyed my transit pass. This is annoying because the system won't let me on the train no matter what and refuses to spawn me a new pass. Does the AI want to trap me here? I guess the best move will be to walk back through the offices and try to find a simulation exit elevator. After fighting through a few more null hotties and roly polyolies, you eventually make it to the elevator mentioned in that clipboard. Upon smashing the big red button to GTF out of there, the elevator breaks and once again you find yourself completely f***. But at least you finally entered the Bone Lab hub, 
Once you use the crane to complete the infamously vague light orb puzzle to open the quarantine door, you climb the hole in the wall and continue on your merry way searching for answers. By the way, if you're stuck in this part, I have a YouTube short explaining exactly what you need to do to get out of it. Feel free to check it out here. Oh, what's this we have here? Check out the doorknob. Does it remind you of anything? That's right. Just like in Boneworks, the baseball from Duck Season makes another appearance after Jimmy reroutes you off of your cart ride to what we can assume to be a deeper part of Mythos and or Fantasyland. This further solidifies a connection between Duck Season and Bone Lab, as I'll explain later. But for now, let's continue. As you fight your way through hallways upon hallways of Saber Lake ball bouncers, you eventually make it to a fever dream of a radio station, featuring a giant Jimmy explaining how he first got into let's say, extreme body modification. They're pretty good, but you're still a player, and a player won't survive the ascent. What I need is a DM, a creator, a builder. Take this body log, go fill it with Avatar, and come back. Now, Jimmy is so into his augmentations that he wants to spread the love with you too. Therefore, levels 6 through 11 are pretty much just a tech demo, showcasing how and why you would use specific avatars for specific situations. So after busting some skulls and getting severe motion sickness, you finally make it to the home stretch of the campaign. Jimmy gives you your body log as well as a key which can be inserted into the crane map thingamajig to access the Boneworks memory profile. It can be assumed that the area you end up in next is within the part of the Boneworks engine that manages Fantasyland. After fighting through some more Saber Lake holograms, null bodies, crablets, and more, you make it to one one more room containing the mad scribblings of what are likely Monogon slash Bone Lab slash Bone Works employees, as well as another clipboard basically confirming the above. Oh, wait now, what are these? More mad scribblings, it turns out, but this one adds a bit of information. You'll notice that some of these wall writings suggest that Monogon may have abandoned not only their staff and NPCs in Fantasyland, but also some of their paying clients. You see messages like, we paid them, and I want a refund. Now, this makes me ponder just how the heck Monogon plans on getting away with this, since in the real world there will be like a mass disappearance of people who were last seen using Monogon headsets. Regardless, from here you enter the giant platform in the middle of the room and proceed to ascend the wishing well. It's time to end things where they all began. As you begin to resurface, you may begin to recognize the familiar scenery. Yep, this is the same village that tried to hang you for basically being trans in the beginning of the game. As you slaughter your way through the village making these sentient binaries beg for death, you may notice that though the village is set in the medieval ages, they're randomly equipped with guns and other advanced weaponry. Now this goes back to a clipboard you find in the beginning of the game before entering the Bone Lab hub, which mentions how a Bone Lab supervisor sent weapons up the wishing well in order to turn the villagers violent. He did this in retaliation after the NPCs sealed up access to the catacombs and started viewing Bone Lab staff slash cast members in a negative light. And it seems to have worked. You eventually make your way to a windmill in a seemingly open field. When you climb your way up, Jimmy's giant ass finger reaches out to lift you to relative safety in a section he's claimed in the void. Upon taking that random ass taxi ride with Jimmy, he reveals that he's involved in the group of Mythos slash Bonework hackers known as the Lava Gang. Cue round of applause. He reveals that the purpose of Lava Gang is to create without limits. Everything out there is about building, about creation. Which he fulfills most easily by using anomalies from the void, like those giant bounce pads, for example. Stop playing the game how it's meant to be played. Look for anomalies. Look for breaks. Now that we know who the likely leader of the Lava Gang is, as well as their purpose, it's time to revisit that Duck Season easter egg I mentioned in the beginning of this video. Although we do know that Lava Gang taught nobodies how to ferment and consume Melon Belly, there's an important piece of information you get from Duck Season that cannot be ignored. In said easter egg, you're tricked by Nine, the evil cat clock entity of the Void, into solving a puzzle which sets him free. But where did he go? Well, you'll notice three different doors with three different writings on them. The first one reads Boneworks, the second one reads Dead.fm, and the last one reads Machine King. The cat's paw prints are clearly seen entering the second doorway, which is wide open. Originally, these three doors were thought to be three different Stress Level Zero games, with Boneworks being the first. But instead, it seems like the writing on these doors represent key plot points within their game, rather than just being titles of the games themselves. With this in mind, you can now easily connect Dead.fm with Bone Lab, Jimmy, 
Nine, and the corruption of the Null Bodies. Lava Gang's goal for feeding Nulls Melon Belly was to sever them from Monogon's control, giving themselves the remote. Lava Gang wanted the Null Bodies to work for them instead of Monogon. But why then would Lava Gang want to turn the Nullmen sentient, as this seems to work against their goals of enslaving them? This is where I believe Nine comes in. We know that Dead.FM is Jimmy's radio station, and that Jimmy is the likely leader, or is at least deeply involved with, the Lava Gang, who taught the Nulls how to ferment the drink. But I think it makes the most sense that Nine corrupted the process somewhere along the line between the fermentation process and the corruption of Melon Belly by the Nulls. Not to mention all the cat drawings on each of the Melon Belly barrels, which I know now they're saying is supposed to be a bunny rabbit, but come on bruh. This theory can be further supported by an event transpiring in Boneworks. Upon reaching the system clock, you notice a group of Nullmen almost ritualistically removing gravity cores from the clock, in what Hayes thinks is an attempt to open a void gate to the real world. Okay, so little update. Uh, we can see what's going on, and something is definitely controlling the Nullmen. They're pulling gravity cores from the system clock, Maybe to open some kind of void gate? I, I don't know, but all I know is that this is super dangerous. So good luck, man. This would make sense, as removing all of the gravity cores would likely cause the giant sphere to fall and smash the void pyramid below it. And this is likely Nine's attempt to escape the Bonework slash Myth OS in order to finally make it to the real world. Now, it's important to note this has not been confirmed by Stress Level Zero or the community at large, but I think the theory makes sense, at least until proven otherwise. <laughs> there you have it! The entire Bone Lab story explained, as well as how it connects to the rest of Stress Level Zero's multiverse. Special thanks to A Wolf in VR, Grease Scotsman, Virtual Panda, and MatPat from The Game Theorist. All of these creators have fantastic, super thorough videos on theories and confirmed lore from Boneworks and Duck Season that helped me immensely when researching for this video. In fact, it seems Virtual Panda may have a series coming out on Bone Lab lore as well, so definitely be sure to check that out after finishing this one, of course. I also want to thank Michael Wyckoff for his phenomenal Boneworks music that was used throughout this video. So that's the Bone Lab story as I see it. But did I get anything wrong? Have I missed any crucial pieces of lore? Do you have any other? theories? Well, be sure to let me know in the comments below, as I'm sure you will let me know when I'm wrong. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like button as it massively helps a small-ass creator like myself. Also, hit subscribe if you want to become an official Harknesian and stay up to date on the latest and greatest Bone Lab and VR content. I also stream on Twitch most weeknights from 8pm to 10pm Eastern, so feel free to tune in to that to boost my ever-shrinking confidence as well. Oh, and I'm also working on a pretty sick Discord too, so stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of the video. This has been Harknesius. Peace!